this video was originally recorded December 2020. It is brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House US Menla membership community and viewers like you. Okay, welcome everybody. I'm so happy and uh, honored to have um, the author and uh, and uh, brave adventurer and feminist activist Kiri Westby on the line with me, and uh, to talk about her wonderful new book, "Fortune Favors the Brave," which uh, which I like a lot. It's about some of her adventures in the past. And um, so I'm very delighted to have her. And uh, she had um, she published this wonderful book uh, last year, and she had a 30 city tour waiting to go. And then, bam, <laughs> the um, nature, the the animals from the ravaged uh, rainforest struck back at humanity, and we've been locked down ever since. And she's now home in Boulder, I believe. And I'm here in, yeah. the, in the Catskill Mountains, and I haven't left here except for one day. I went to New York City for one night wow. uh, in the last, uh, last year. Uh, but, um, and I don't know, I think you had more adventures than me, Kitty. So anyway, <laughs> welcome, and how are you doing? How is the family? How's everyone? Thanks, Bob. I'm so excited to be here with you in this moment. And um, we're doing well. It's um, day after Christmas, Boxing Day. And um, I'm my kids are sort of mercifully sleeping in a bit after um, a big day yesterday. Yes, yes, so. big Christmas day, and uh, yes. it's a wonderful thing for the children. You know, we are at the grandchildren level, and they're at different ages, and so some are here, some are not here. It's been very confusing trying to schedule the Santa moment. <laughs> sure, you know? it's been very complicated. <laughs> so now, Kiri, please tell us a little bit. How did you get on this amazing trip? that you chronicle, I mean, and you can start, if you like, in your previous lives, <laughs> you remember them. <laughs> I know. Whatever you like, or you can, start, you can start in your youth, or you can start anywhere you like. Please tell us how you got onto this amazing trip that you chronicle in your exciting book. Well, it does seem that way a little bit, a little bit faded from lifetimes. Um, but I, I was born into the sort of experimental and new branch of um, Tibetan Buddhism called Shambhala in Boulder. Mm -hmm. And I was raised in um, private Buddhist schools mm -hmm. through my childhood and <clears throat> took different um, vows and Dharmic art practices through my mm -hmm. education. Um, mm -hmm. So I think early on, I always had a, kind of an awareness of certain tenets of Buddhism, like karma and merit and reincarnation and a lot of those sort of basic tenets uh -huh. and thoughts. And um, I also was aware of the occupation of Tibet because the teacher was a Tibetan um, exile, refugee. And mm -hmm. I was sort of aware of the concept of occupation or mm -hmm. war, um, mm -hmm. armed mm -hmm. conflict from an early age. Mm -hmm. So those things kind of combined in my early 20s mm -hmm. when I was recruited found a job with this very exciting and brand new um, frontline feminist funding network called mm -hmm. Urgent Action Fund. Mm -hmm. And um, at 22, I was their first full-time employee. And we, we were seeking to kind of revolutionize the old model of philanthropic funding, mm -hmm. especially in war zones, mm -hmm. and to cut out some of the middlemen and to mm -hmm. create really direct networks of connections with mm -hmm. feminist activists on the mm -hmm. ground and mm -hmm. to get money and resources into their hands mm -hmm. with the least amount of red tape as possible, mm -hmm. which was mm -hmm. revolutionary in the funding world. Mm -hmm. So... Um, the first is, five I years think. of my activism, mm -hmm. I think it still is. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. First five years of my activism were spent traveling in and out of war zones, mm -hmm. building these networks of mm -hmm. trust and communication mm -hmm. so we could move money and resources quickly. Mm -hmm. um, the International Criminal Court was being developed and we're starting to try cases around war crimes. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. we were providing direct evidence, mm -hmm. documented evidence. We were providing money on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, 
Now, what's interesting about that is I was a 22 year old blonde American girl <laughs> and I was sort of the least um, likely person to come walking up by foot to walk across the border into say the Democratic Republic of Congo oh. or up into Aceh or mm -hmm. in certain places. And so almost my, um, my anomaly caused me to have a certain amount of privilege and movement mm -hmm. and um, my passport. And I, I, I was learning how to use those unearned privileges as mm -hmm. a, a tool, a tool mm -hmm. to leverage within mm -hmm. movements mm -hmm. because I could cross borders, others couldn't mm -hmm. because I was um, often not searched in the same way others were. Mm -hmm. And so I became sort of um, a tool for this new fund to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. move money, information, resources across borders clandestinely. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I had been doing that for many years mm -hmm. and um, and just as a side note, I just want to share with you, you may not know that this past week, Mackenzie Scott, the ex-wife of Jeff Bezos of Amazon, mm -hmm. donated, you know, $4 billion. Yes, well, I did hear that. Yes. And um, Urgent Action Fund received $20 million of that. Oh, so that's wonderful. This fledgling vision idea that we had that we could <laughs> do this. And all the nights of writing grant proposals and begging for every dollar and every donation, um, us sort of founding mothers have been celebrating all week that like it's going to have an impact for generations oh, long that's, beyond that's us. That's wonderful. Are you going to continue so, to work with them yourself? Um, yeah, I think in some capacity, I always like I always considered part of the to be part of the your Urgent Action Fund family. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, on March eighth of this year, they threw the book launch for Fortune Favors the Brave, oh, which um, then on March 9th, the country shut down, but uh, it was on International <laughs> Women's Day and we had our last final celebration. Oh, yeah. and, um, and the book is a fundraiser for both Urgent Action Fund and for students for a free Tibet. I'll show you the right. fun cover. I love and, um, it. So, I love it. Thank you. And so, um, yeah, so I think, um, there's just it's just been a really good week, a good end to a painful and difficult year to know mm -hmm. that this work we sort of pulled together and risked so much to create will continue in perpetuity. Absolutely. I hope so. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, so, you know, I remember I remember reading your book and that particularly you had some very scary encounter. What was the most frightening encounter that you had actually, maybe? Can you, you want, can think, you tell us in your I own think words? there's a moment I detail of a mission I was in in the Democratic Republic of Congo mm -hmm. in which I got off the plane for a stop, a pit stop. And I, we were maybe not aware that that particular stop was held by a rebel faction. Mm -hmm. And I took a photograph. It seems simple, but mm -hmm. it can be quite a dangerous thing to do in a war zone. Mm -hmm. And sure. within minutes, I myself and my colleague had machine guns pointed at our faces and we were walked off the plane and brought into um, a small shack. And we didn't know if the plane had left with all of our belongings and we were highly interrogated. And I think that was one of the moments where I thought I may just die here and nobody would know for a very mm -hmm, long time. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, how did you, how did you escape? I escaped because I happened to have a $20 bill in my pocket <laughs> randomly. <laughs> After a lot of negotiations, I reached into my pocket and I felt this corner of a bill that I hadn't, I'd had too much for the cab driver to the way to the airport. And, um, and I offered it up and suddenly the whole tone changed and <laughs> we were allowed to go back onto the plane. I oh my wow, for $20, what that wouldn't get me back home in Boulder. Oh my goodness, my <laughs> but goodness. the price of our freedom in the Congo. So yeah, I remember you telling me about Congo, how terrifying it is to even think of the, the backwoods there in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And I remember you yeah. telling me about how you ran into a lot of these poor young girls who were badly mutilated and had been badly treated. I mean, really, I mean, horrendously, practically yeah. death's door and uh, and a violation of uh, that any kind of violence you can imagine. And um, and they were brandishing and asking you about Angelina and you're telling me yeah. that she made she had made a huge <laughs> impact there and I was, was just, I was very surprised 
very courageous of her, I think. And so do, did you find yeah. traces of her and more? You were in a number of places there, I think. Is that right? Yeah. At the same time she was doing as a goodwill ambassador and conflict zones, I was doing a lot of this work. And um, right. I'm not someone who has television or has watched a lot of movies in my life. But um, yes. in the activist world, I know her name as someone who is incredibly legitimate and really has put herself in places very few yes. people would dare to go. Yes, especially yes, people I of her statue. Statue. I was deeply mm -hmm. impressed by that myself. I, I really, I really admire that in her. You know, don't know yeah. what she's been doing since, but I do admire that, and in you. So, um, so um, this is amazing, amazing that you had this uh, uh, bravery to do this. So, in, when you say you understand, to go back to what you said before, you were brought up in the Shambhala community. And mm -hmm. as a child, and you learned about reincarnation and about karma and so on. How do you how do how do you think that enabled you or spurred you or to to join such a dangerous activities? Actually, what, what was it that gave you the courage? Well, how, how 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 can you say that? Well, so the main premise that sort of in the way I write my book and tell my story is mm -hmm. through this the bravest action of my life, which was mm -hmm. at Mount Everest in 2007, uh -huh. um, where I joined a Tibetan freedom protest. Yes. And um, were sort of very publicly arrested and disappeared by the Chinese government, right, mm -hmm. as they were leading up to the 2008 Beijing Olympics. You were more and, scared um, by that than about, <clears throat> you were more frightened by that than about the Congo? The Chinese were more scary than that's really interesting or equally. It or got similarly. scarier as the days went on, for sure. Mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. think it was one of those where I went in purposefully at, with a lot of um, American kind of bravado. And I used a lot of the tricks I'd learned in all my years in war zones mm -hmm. to help a Tibetan Ten, Tenzin Dorje to sort of mm -hmm. sneak into Lhasa and mm -hmm. across the Tibetan plateau and up mm -hmm. to Everest, mm -hmm. which is an incredibly difficult thing to do. And you oh, go yes, through I know. Mm -hmm. so many checkpoints and you have so many permits to apply for. And at each one, I had to pull out just the ugliest side of that American entitled, you can't, we're refusing to take no for an answer yes, attitude. Yes. Yes, and yes. so when I got, when we got to the day of the protest and it actually miraculously worked and we were the first, I think, to send a satellite signal from base camp with images uh -huh. to a computer in New York. Uh -huh. um, I think I went into the arrests maybe with a lot of that kind of bravado and arrogance in, yes. in, to begin with. Yes. And to begin with, we were arrested by the local military who lived uh -huh. there and who um, there's a small jail there at Everest Base Camp. But it wasn't there wasn't too much aggression. They had guns, yes. but they also were giving us cigarettes and water. And it was kind of like yes. they were shocked that we had even done it. Yes, and at right. that point, nobody knew that it was more than just a local action. Nobody there knew we had had a satellite and we'd sent this whole video <laughs> out. And so it was a lot of just confusion in the first 14 hours that we were held in that cell there at base camp. Mm -hmm. And I did some media interviews from the toilet. They never searched us. They didn't take my phone. Um, and then about 14 hours later, the the secret police, the um, showed up oh, dear. and it, everything changed. And mm -hmm. so then they searched us, separated us and started systematically threatening us and intimidating us and mm -hmm. um, abusing all the Tibetans around us that had had mm -hmm. any contact mm -hmm. with us. And mm -hmm. um, just by the second or third day of being in interrogation, I, I did think that that would be the end of my life as I knew it, that I was going to spend the rest of my life in a prison camp, um, or at least for a long time in my life. Mm -hmm, and I had grown mm -hmm. up with stories of Paul Dungyatso, and I had grown up with stories of the Dropshi nuns, and I knew yes. about some of the stories that had snuck out from yes, yes. Uh, Chinese prison camps. And I had sort of had this picture of where I was heading in my mind. And um, right. But once again, our strategy, our security strategy was what it would happen if they did this to Americans mm -hmm. from average Americans from Colorado and San mm -hmm. Francisco. Mm -hmm. Would they treat us the same way? Would, what mm -hmm. would happen if you could apply that political pressure? Mm -hmm. um, and it worked. And so mm -hmm. within three days, our congressmen were speaking, our president got involved, secretary of state got involved, and mm -hmm. we were actually released instead of being charged. Mm -hmm. So thank goodness. Um, 
But I think that, yeah, I think it all comes together. It's like my upbringing in the Buddhism and having those sort of thoughts about merit and what this lifetime mm -hmm. is all about. Mm -hmm. And um, combining with years of clandestine work in war zones. And mm -hmm. I was sort of the right person for this one role at this one moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, Students for a Free Tibet was looking for people like me and other sort of American activists willing mm -hmm. to use mm -hmm. our passports. Mm -hmm. to leverage this story mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it worked and it was like mm -hmm. us five nonviolent um americans went there and we caused a huge thorn in the side of the world's m largest authoritarian mm -hmm, mm -hmm, government mm -hmm. it was very 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 so, good it was very good some people of course feel that there's always the feeling uh, uh, you know i have heard people say that it was unnecessarily provocative and it brought worse crackdown yeah. on Tibetans and this sort of thing. There is that feeling in some quarters. And everything. Definitely. Have you have you encountered that? That you know that I did, yeah. Even in the Shambhala world a bit about sort of how it prevented certain teachers from traveling and how mm -hmm. it caused further suffering and mm -hmm. um, it's kind of that old sort of argument against stirring the pot. Mm -hmm. You know, like just stay where you are, and if you stir the pot, it'll get worse. Right, right, right. Um, I think my training is more to be a pot stirrer and a yeah. bit of a truth teller, and to say, <laughs> you know, the real, the real, you know, perpetrator is the Chinese government. Yes, it's not us five unarmed Americans. Yes, of course. And if and things did get worse in Tibet through 2008, and a huge uprising occurred, um, but there's also messages from within Tibet that people felt very um, supported by our actions, that yes, yes. people they'd never met would care enough to put their lives yes. on the line in another country, yeah. Yes, yes, so I think it is an unbalanced, truth is really great. And uh, even if it, uh, if it seems to make things worse, it's because the underlying worse has been li is lying there and is being inflicted on people mm -hmm. steadily in a sort of structural injustice and structural oppression and so on. And so this sort of brings yeah. it out. It, it's sort of like what maybe um, sometimes I think the, the horrendous uh, Trump years will ultimately signify it was a time in a way you could say he's, 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 he's brought the sort of white supremacy and all these kinds of insane uh, regressive uh, American strands that have been there since the Native American genocide and through the slavery and through the Civil War and all of that. And he's brought it out. Uh, he's added to it or he's been the conclusion of it, you can say, in one sense. And in another, in another sense, he blew the cover of people who were dog whistling for decades, if not centuries. Definitely. And we're and I think he's holding a, yeah. us back from realizing maybe you could say the the ideal, not just an American ideal, but a Christian ideal, a Buddhist ideal, you know, an Islamic a spiritual ideal, you know, that even the secular mm -hmm. humanists maybe have, you could say. So truth has to be there, even if it seems to have immediate painful consequences by the baddies. Yeah, and I think this was the mm -hmm. year that so many people found what their line was, you know, whether it was the murder of George Floyd or the uh -huh. mishandling of the pandemic or yeah. the just blatant corruption in government mm -hmm. where what we're seeing is we're seeing people who are within those privileged circles of power speaking out. We're seeing yes. whistleblowers and people speaking their truth to power in yes. a way that creates real change. Yes, it is not yes, about yes. Some savior complex yeah. of others, but it's about yeah. using the leveraging the mm -hmm. access we have to mm -hmm. make change. Mm -hmm. and, um, Absolutely. Sometimes I feel like in the Buddhist world, like, you know, my parents were part of that kind of travelers who went to India in 1970 from across the great hippie trail mm -hmm. and kind of part of like, um, like a, the big kind of I inhalation, if you will, of Buddhist Dharma mm -hmm. and <clears throat> My generation, I feel, is part of the exhalation or the outbreath <laughs> of what that created, because it created hundreds of us who were also raised in a certain way, who see our lives as um, useful and are meaningful as we act on behalf of others. And uh -huh, so, uh -huh. um, I think that I'm seeing that in lots of places. Yeah, that's wonderful. You, you, I don't know if you know me, uh, Michelle Alexander. If you know who that is. Who wrote? A, no. She's a sociologist at uh, 
I think University of Chicago or or somewhere some nearby university. And uh, sorry, I'm not specific on that. And uh, she wrote a wonderful book called The New Jim Crow. And mm, uh, I've heard the book. Yeah. She wrote an op-ed in the New York Times that I loved uh, sometime during last this last horrendous year, in which she said she almost wished that she believed in reincarnation or that people in general did, because maybe then yeah. there would be less cruelty and less horrendous behavior on their part if they actually did. And I was so surprised by that. I don't know her. I, I had once a chance to meet her and unfortunately missed the chance. And um, she's friends of some friends of mine at the Union Seminary in New York. And um, they had, I was invited to a dialogue thing with her, but I couldn't make it. But uh, not the, a, few, a year before, before that. But um, I was struck by that. And, uh, and I wonder if you feel that. Do you feel when you were facing death in a, the other one that I was that I remember is where you had to sneak out through a bathroom where you were being imprisoned to be molested in a rather bit bad way, and, and that was in Congo, I think, right? That was in Sri and, Lanka, actually. That was oh, in, in Sri, Sri Lanka. Lanka. Oh, mm. in Sri Lanka. Oh dear. In Sri okay, Lanka. in Sri Lanka, uh -huh. a terrible, formerly formerly a Buddhist country. Uh, oh, right. exactly. <laughs> and in some respects, still, but not totally, obviously. And uh, I mean, did that uh, did that actually make you feel? that death would be just another adventure? Or was there any way it changed your attitude about the danger of that fear of death? Did it affect you in any way? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there's this saying these days among young people, YOLO, have you heard that? It's yeah, Y-O-L-O, well, -O, and yeah. it stands for you, you only live once. And it's oh, a really? sort of a, oh. a sense of like, you know, no responsibility, no accountability, YOLO. And I see it a lot with younger kids and younger people I interact with. Really? And it's so I didn't know that opposite one. to wow. my Buddhist training, which yes. is like, no, really, you don't only live once. And that there's so much <laughs> that happens in this lifetime, in my belief, that has profound effects on lifetimes after you're here. Yes. And that um, we, I think if there's an underlying message to this pandemic it's that same like if you act individually you are at risk if you can act communally or think beyond yourself yes. you may survive this and so yes. um i think and it may be also the kind of concept of the bodhisattva and the bodhisattva vows which yes. are about coming back again lifetimes until to, to help yes. humanity and to work with liberating humanity and um those kind of combine into my activism in war zones. Um, but yeah, I did several times think that this may be the way that I was going to die. Um, yes. And also at the time felt okay with that because I was doing something that I felt so committed to and I was sort of in mm. my truth mm. and in my justice. Mm. And so we all die at some yeah. point. Yes, and yes. I think dying. So your, so your slogan, your slogan would be YOLO at. You, YOLO at, so you only live once at a time. Exactly. <laughs> or you only live a thousand times. <laughs> well, yeah, well, once at a time. You know? Once at a so, time. And so if, if but, any one time you can be infinite, you can be, as, yes. I love what you said, beyond yourself or infinite or expand beyond infinite. just the, the boundary, arbitrary boundary of the yeah. skin. Uh, only once at a time. That's really, really interesting. Really, I thank you. I, I, just, just, I, I never just, do YOLO. I, I, I deal with YOLO <laughs> all the time myself, but they never use the word YOLO or the expression yeah. YOLO. In other words, it's interesting because for years I have um, talk, given talks in many places and I've, been, I've tackled the, the death means that you become nothing attitude mm -hmm. in, in which yeah. leads to a psychotic recklessness of our culture i personally yes. believe it's yes. really Agreed. critical it's a key thing that you can yeah. get out of the consequence of how you live and how you behave just by dying so that in a way right. their death they supposedly although they fool themselves into thinking that they're being brave to be nothing actually since nothing is subliminally understood by them as anesthesia at least no pain mm -hmm then it's exactly. actually an escape. It's a total escape. You know? It's a total and, escape. Uh, so I've and been dealing with that for a long yeah. time, but they never said YOLO. These older <laughs> people, 
And you see, my yeah. my my imprisonment is being imprisoned with the elderly or the older people. Uh -huh. And I don't think Having the young kids, view. the young YOLO kids would have ever come to one of my lectures. So therefore, they yeah. didn't jump up and say, YOLO, yeah, I'm into YOLO. Because otherwise, <laughs> I would have given them YOLO at, you know. Exactly. Words, you know, you at only live once at a time, you know. And, uh, <laughs> well, and, um, I think that so it neat. is interesting that... My book as a memoir, and it's very yes. just raw, my story yes. of coming yes. up against yes. my white privilege, my mm -hmm. Western supremacy, my mm -hmm. heteronormativity, uh -huh. even my feminist fundamentalisms. Uh -huh. I wrote it for <laughs> my sort of younger self. I wrote it for the idealist that wants to go out and save the world so mm -hmm. that I can spare them some of the painful lessons that I learned. Yeah. And you know, and take some of the burden off the women who shared those lessons with me patiently and share them in circles where people can mm -hmm. hear them. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I just spoke to my very first university class mm -hmm. um, that was assigned the book at San Diego mm -hmm. State University and mm -hmm. had a fascinating discussion with young kids, 19, 20 years old, mm -hmm. about their role in the world, about mm. this question about sort of if you're not from a culture, could you go over and work and do make change in that culture? There was mm -hmm. you know, sort of that mm -hmm. criticism mm -hmm. of us being Americans and going into China to Tibet, mm -hmm. which is in our culture and speaking out. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about that and we talked a lot about um, just the importance of story and of sharing one's story. And so mm -hmm. I think, I think what is unique about my book is that it's a memoir and it reads like a novel, like first person, present tense, and mm -hmm. young people can are getting into it. Like mm -hmm. instead oh, of good. it being didactic, yes. it's really encompassing. Yes, they yes, can wonderful. Dive into it. Wonderful. Well, I hope you do. You have a tour planned for after the COVID is over, and you can do one then. I mean, reissue I, it I as would a like paperback to. or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would really yeah. like to. I've gotten some really great feedback from um, people like Ellen Burstyn and great quotes that weren't included in this version of the book. Yes, and, um, good. Well, the plan was for me and my husband and our two kids to get in our old VW van and drive the country and talk to All people right. and hit up independent bookstores. So yeah, I would love good. to do that when I it's safe to do, do so. I think again. it's very, very important. And and of course, I know you. I'm sure you're writing another book. What What is your What are you writing now? What are you doing now? I am. Well, in the ten years that I was working on this book, um, I had two children, so I've been working on a book. It's called Mothering on the Edge, <laughs> oh, <laughs> and God. sort of circumnavigating the hope and fear around um, all of it, postpartum and pandemic playdates and puberty. So my next book will be um, specifically how I apply some of my war zone training to uh -huh. the frontline job of motherhood, which I think right. may be the hardest job in the world. So, right, right, right. Yeah. So that's really exciting. So you, but you don't think of doing active missions again yourself because of the mother responsibility. Maybe you can't so well, or yeah. what do you I think? Mean, now I have a 10 year old and a five year old, so I'm still in yeah. it. And with this pandemic, I'm really in it and learning fifth grade math and bouncing yes. off the wall. Oh, yes. preschooler. Yes. But um, I think, um, I don't think I'll ever stop being an activist, even if it's in different ways. And that's mm -hmm. something that I talk about in my book, which is that sometimes you are at the front line and sometimes mm -hmm. you are invisibly part of the support staff. Mm -hmm. And I have spent a lot of my activism years on the front line mm -hmm. and with my face out there. Mm -hmm. And now a lot of my activism is in support. So mm -hmm. sitting on boards, donating, mm -hmm. supporting activists in a way of self-care that is very mm -hmm. rarely funded. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been doing that all summer, sort of supporting the in the backgrounds as the um, racial uprising has been happening. And so I think I'm still very much involved, mm -hmm. but in a way that... Um, in a way that I can be effectively involved right now. Right, I'm not right, the most right. effective person for the front lines. So right, no, yeah. I agree. And just like, for example, you, you went, you were out there, and there were some elder women who were supporting you and targeting you, and who, who were using having you work within their network, where a younger yeah. person could do something in the sense of be perceived as more, yeah. more innocent and more, more blithe, more. Less, as you said, you were not searched the same way, et cetera, a lot of things like that. And, yeah. uh, and so yeah. there is that other way of, of interacting. And now, now 
I think of the UAF, you know, you call it UAF, the Ubuntu Air Force. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Ubuntu <laughs> but, Activism yeah. uh, uh, Network. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful organization. I hope they're still flourishing, and obviously they are. You oh, yeah. Them. Well, now they have yeah. four sister funds, one in the U.S., one mm -hmm. in Africa, one mm -hmm. in Latin America and the Caribbean, mm -hmm. and one in Asia and Pacific Island. So they like um, mm -hmm. they have 25, maybe 30 full-time employees, all mm -hmm. young people. Oh, good. Oh, now good. they have this incredible gift from... Mackenzie Scott and Fantastic. I think they're going to take over the world. I just I feel like <laughs> I um I have full faith in them. Well, Fully that's good. Them. Well, we could call yeah. it the we could also call it the oxytocin network as opposed to the cortisol <laughs> network that is currently exactly. in charge and is destroying the world. You know the male. We could all the use more thing. oxytocin. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. We all yes. need it's more. That is the oxytocin network. You know, I'm totally. Yeah. A, I mean, actually, when I say you know, I'm intellectually totally a feminist. But my my good wife, uh, as you know her, Nina, I think you've met her. Yes, you have met her, and she yeah. is always telling me that I still have habits, you know. So I'm still I'm mm -hmm. still I'm still a disciple, you know, rather than yeah. an activist. Uh, but but uh, intellectually, certainly, I am a hundred percent feminist, and actually, I shock mm -hmm. Buddhist audiences by teaching that the female embodiment of the humans is the more advanced one rather than the male, even though in the Bo history of Buddhism. There have been many more known male, you know, saints and meditators and so forth who are known, but they all have been mm -hmm. instructed by females, actually, really, right. especially if you look in the tantras. But you don't know the names of the females. The females are not named. They didn't write the books, et cetera, usually. Right. Very, very few. Right. Very few. And that should change now, actually. That should change. So I think we need yeah. a lot of yoginis, and, uh, and I, I've been trying to teach them. I have a thing called Vajra Yoga. I'm trying to teach them. But anyway, you should uh, you should definitely. So you said some painful things that you had mistakes that you made. You, you, can you think of any that you could save a young person, top of my younger head. person yeah. from? <laughs> um, yeah, I think that um, it, it was sort of the slow waking up to a lot of the Western privileges and sort of viewpoints that I had mm -hmm. when I got into real global international activism mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. was seeing the role my country and my government was actually playing outside mm -hmm. of my government. Mm -hmm. That was quite eye-opening for me as mm -hmm. a young person mm -hmm. and really led me to come back to my own country to mm -hmm. sort of make that shift back into the unearned circles, under privileged circles that I could have my voice be mm. effective. Mm -hmm, and it was mm -hmm. an activist, a South African activist, actually, that said to me, you know, what are you doing here in Africa when it's your government who you need to be lobbying, who are mm -hmm. actively underdeveloping mm -hmm. the world? And um, mm -hmm. that hit very, very strongly with me as mm -hmm. I kind of came back into my country. Now mm -hmm. I do a lot of political work and activism. Oh, well, good, within. good. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Yes. Although, although I do feel, for example, what is America anyway? You know, in other right. words, there's a, there's one America that isn't America, but unfortunately rules it sometimes and directs it in the wrong direction. That is a sort of last vestige of the British Empire. You know, the right. Benedict that Arnold. Manifest like, destiny we, we kind had, of, yeah. We finally had a Benedict Arnold for a president. <laughs> Actual yeah. Benedict Arnold, who was in league with the KGB, with the Nazis, with the civil, with the secessionists, you know, that yeah. they, with the slaveholders and with the Native American genociders, which I don't yeah. believe those people have ever arrived in America. They all lament that we weren't just we weren't just there openly expanding the British Empire. To me, that's been right. the that's been what that is. Whereas what really America is is a nation of immigrants. And a nation of yeah. people who who are aware that somehow we represent, we represent and we should try to represent a possibility of all the different mm -hmm. nations. You know, like in Jefferson's second inaugural, the idea is that we create an example that leads other nations to try to not be super casteist, classist, racist, genocidal about their yeah. lower classes, etc., enslaving their lower classes, and that that's that's really the mission. On the Turtle yeah. Island, let's call it Turtle Island. I don't know if we want to use a different <laughs> name, but which is because the American name is actually a you know colonist name or the, the Portuguese yeah. guy, you know, well, the Portuguese yeah. landed down in Brazil. But uh, the thing is, so that to me is what America really is, and uh, so to me that means that you can resist those who say, you know, 
But of course, and it is our fault that those of us who have that attitude about what America is have not somehow gain, remained in control of the machinery of the government, which has more been used in mm. a neo-colonialist way. You know? yeah. And, and, and yeah, you just put it down, I'll come up with neo neo-colonialist way. So I think there's two kinds of, we should, we should insist that there are two kinds of America. And yeah. we are the we are the real one, actually the one. Well, and they it takes come... more active. That is what people are waking up to. Young people, as they're saying, if we don't vote, if we don't put the people, even in the smallest places of leadership, that yes. think for all, then this is yes. what it looks like. Because they people, yes. you know, are, it's a it's a constant thing to strive for and to be part of. And yes, I, um, yes. you know, my exactly. ancestors came over on the Mayflower in 1620, 400 years ago, and we're striving yes. for religious yeah, mine freedom. Went, mine, went to, mine went to Jamestown. <laughs> to Jamestown. So I, I come from that 400 years of the American experiment. And um, I think that we have to be honest about our history as we have been starting to be yes. this year more than ever, about yes. who it is exactly. that we exactly. have claimed as heroes from our past. Mm -hmm. And I think young people, myself and younger, are not gonna put up with it. It's sort of, I hope mm -hmm. what we're seeing is the last gasp of white supremacy, as those of us that are watching it in horror are saying, okay, no longer should we be so focused on the needs of people outside in this kind of white savior complex. It's time to really come home and focus on the problematics within how we haven't participated, our apathy and our lack of um, active participation in the world yes. we wanna live in. We have to create yes, the yes. world we wanna live in, each of us, and every person has a role in yes. that. Yes, so, yes, so I, I, I 100% agree. But, but on the other hand, we have to, we, you know, how do we deal with those whites that are still there behaving like that? And yeah, do we, and I'll do tell we, you an despair? interesting... In other words, a lot of people yeah. right now are despaired because 73 million voted for Benedict yeah. Arnold. Right. And 73, 73 million voted not to be the America that is, that is the true dream, which is right. a multiracial dream, because they don't want to admit that the whites who came here actually were the riffraff and the draft and the dregs of the European yeah. caste system. And yeah. they were escaping actually from an oppressiveness that they found right. in Europe. And then, right. then, they, then they became, then they, then they started oppressing the Native Americans first, yeah. which of course, even the, even the Black Lives Matter people forget that they are not the worst, they're not the worst example actually. Even worse than them, genocide. because at least they were worth money. <laughs> but the worse than them are the native people. Yeah, and uh, and I, I had an experience at Columbia, for example, where I tried to hire a Native American theologian who mm -hmm. works in Athens at the University of Georgia, well trained mm -hmm. and here and there, you know. But but he's a very he he's, he he coined an expression, the not quite post-colonial world, not mm -hmm. yet post-colonial, not yet living mm -hmm. living on Cherokee land. And working for yeah. a white university after Jackson had, you know, killed so many of his ancestors who tried to yeah. assimilate with us and tried to be a partner's neighbors to us, and then they were completely yeah. genocided anyway. And right. uh, and and he couldn't be hired in the new sort of post-colonial, you know, ethnic department that was formed by active by black activists mainly, but some other people supporting because they wanted to first get the blacks and Latinos. So they felt that was more important and never mind the Native Americans. So they wouldn't yeah. hire this guy. <laughs> and so well, you know, I think there's, the, yeah, there's I that mean, deeper, there's that deeper, deeper trauma wound. that we, that we also have to embrace, you know. We do, we, we have to acknowledge to it that. and we have to teach our children a different history than was taught to us. Yes, and we so have that to teach them that the white people, that the white people yeah. actually are the ones who found refuge here given by those people and yes. who, who still need refuge and who should not be behaving like imperialists. And we need that to show that as the real effort of America so that we don't, we don't have to feel that, well, we have to exterminate 73 million lunatics because there aren't that right. many actually really they just get drawn into the dark side by the by the stupidity of the people and i think there's really only 20 of them you know like it's i also 20%, think you know there's 18%. like 18% 
So we maybe we had like more people voted in this last election than ever before, 140 mm -hmm. some, 150 some million. Mm -hmm. But there's 100 million eligible voters that didn't vote, 75 exactly. million or so. And so exactly. they represent who we need to work with more than the 73 exactly. who voted for Trump. Yeah, and but, get them but even engaged. the 73, this is the great thing about it. Even the 73 are not really there. Maybe of those 25. That's exactly. Maximum. The real I think baddies, a lot of people don't know. The real, the real ones who need serious, you know, uh, rehabilitation. You know, re rehabilitation, <laughs> yes, are only around twenty. I remember Senator, ex former Senator Bill Bradley, telling me a couple of elections ago at a dinner that he always faced eighteen to twenty percent loonies, you mm, know, who were yeah. ready to shoot everybody Fringe, and whatever. Right. And he had, and they were that was a steady. He was re encouraging some other people at that dinner who felt really at sea and lost, you know, because of the, of the, for example, you know, those people have, have, have basically burned Hillary like at the stake. She's been a witch burned, but not Definitely. for just, not since 2016. She's been witch burned since 1986 the beginning. or 1978. She is the, sca the scapegoat of all misogyny. Oh, she is. is, is and, Hillary. But actually, yeah. this is the key. She actually won she won the election in 2016. We have to remember that. Yeah. The, the voter suppression, canceling the voter suppression, canceling the, the few extremists in power who blocked yeah. her and who added to the Roger Stone witch burning routine, you know, that did her in. She yeah. actually still won the election. Yeah. So we still successfully elected her. And, yeah. uh, and, and also we did elect Al Gore to turn against yeah. the, the oil dinosaur evil group you know yeah and and but they suppressed and they cheated and they even yeah. got the court to cheat with them and it was just a few people on the court that's like three or four people who stopped the county yeah. in florida we he won actually so yeah. we never this is important for us i by the way i don't refer to white people i don't okay. think there is a category they're all pink. I mean, yeah, it's definitely a construct. No, no, they're pink. I think <laughs> it's a category pink. of pink, and even you could say blotchy pink, in blotchy search pink, of a tan. Yeah. Blotchy <laughs> pink, heading for the tropics in search of a tan. That's really their color. There's no white. White are some clowns painted with white uh, chalk. <laughs> right. There's no white. <laughs> Right, With right. but the there is a people. construct in people's minds of white oh, supremacy yes. that is so dangerous. Pink. They're yeah, a bunch of pinkos. It's dangerous and it's fake news. Yeah. You dig that? They're pink. Yeah. I, I came up with that once, lecture and giving a lecture at George Washington University in DC, which is a, a pretty much a black university. And I suddenly realized, listen, guys, don't be pissed. I'm not white, I'm pink. Everybody's <laughs> only just and blotchy pink, especially when you get alcoholic, like they mostly are. You know, exactly. they, their drug of choice is alcohol. And then they right. got, then the nose gets all veins come out, the little capillaries, oh. and they're really blotchy pink. And <laughs> yes. so that's key. That's what we're we're worrying about blotchy pinks who are putting on powder like clowns to be white. We have to realize that. And we have to keep humor in there and don't feel desperate, you know. That's right. really, Although, really key. You know, I'll tell you this year I had a really sobering experience in which uh -oh. I had been invited into a um a book club in a mm -hmm. large corporation yes. um, that was doing mm -hmm. a new book club to look at issues of racial equity and social justice. Mm -hmm. So I was brought in as sort of a white American activist who talks about mm -hmm. some of these issues through my path to becoming a global activist. And right. um the week before or about a month before I was on the docket. Um, Trump issued this executive order against racial and sexual stereotyping mm -hmm. for all private and public contractors of the government. You could no longer talk about racial diversity trainings. You could no longer talk about oh, really? sexism. You could no longer talk really? about white supremacy or white privilege. And so I got a call from, a, from the corporation I was going to be working with that their lawyers had deemed my book kind of too controversial. And they've okay. put me back on the docket for after the inauguration. But in all seriousness, that, that executive order affected Listen. universities. I know Listen. Berkeley issued a list of topics you couldn't talk about in class. I mean, this is extremist stuff. So as yeah, much as white, is. whiteness is not real, it is real in terms of this kind of, of protection course, around even discussing it. And that was Listen. the specific 
wording I was told I couldn't use was white privilege as a term. I, I was I was invited once when I used to do wide scale lecturing to yeah. a Pepsi Cola thing. And there they had two lunches with me ahead of time to insist that the only way I could come would be if I didn't mention Tibet. I couldn't come yeah. if I had to mention Tibet. So I just said, okay, I'll do it. I won't talk. I don't have to talk about it. I can talk about general ethics and this and that and so on. And then it was so funny. Richard Holbrook was at the same convention, same event. And the first thing he did, because he hadn't been prepped when he gave his talk, of course, ahead of me, because it's more important, you know, the late Richard Holbrook. And he said, yeah. oh, you guys should ask Bob about Tibet. <laughs> 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 and they all went, oh. they were doing semaphore signals and all this kind of nonsense. So anyway, to get revenge on them, I, I told a, I told the joke about a Coke joke in the in the Tibet in a Pepsi thing, and and nearly got burned at the stake myself. Nearly got burned. <laughs> <laughs> so they oh, nobody left. Nobody left. And an excellent joke because it involved Coca Cola. So you can't do that. You can't even mention the word. It's like a religion. No. So people can become fanatical about whatever it is. Is the point? We have to be careful about that. Definitely. Anyway, We've listen. You are to, such a yeah. breath of fresh air. You are oh, such a thanks, YOLO Bob. at YOLO at UAS. <laughs> YOLO at entrepreneur. One at a time. I love it. I love it. And so, but you did one thing you didn't tell me what's the latest thing you're writing. The last thing. Let's last question. You yeah, we well, I'm on? working on two mm -hmm. things. One, I'm working on yeah. a um documentary about yeah. the protest at oh, Mount good. Everest. And oh, good. um we shot incredible behind the scenes footage on the way across Tibet and all the way up oh, to the morning wow. of the oh, protest. Great. Wonderful. Now, you won't be shocked to hear that we've received some backlash in Hollywood about that same thing. You mentioned Tibet and people get very scared and yes, oh, uh, sure. the, a backlash well, around making films. So Chinese investment is all over Hollywood. All know. over Hollywood. And so mm -hmm. we've been trying to find some brave filmmakers to partner with us to make that happen and risk right. their their um, names. But um, and I'm writing a book about a motherhood, about mothering on the edge, and about raising young warriors, young anti-racist mm -hmm. global citizens to kind of reform this world we've done so much destruction to. Mm -hmm. So that's good for you. that's good what for I'm working that. on now. Yeah, good for you. You know, just before this, uh, just the other day, in thinking about our interview today, and I, I hope it's the first of many because I, I needed to learn a lot from you. Boy, I think you really <laughs> an avant-garde. You really are the young people are. And uh, and the thing is that um, I was reading a wonderful interview Jonathan Cott, a friend of mine, did years ago, published in a book of interviews, uh, with um, the author of P.P. Longstocking. Mm-hmm. You know, did you was that a current book in your Shambhala youth? Did you all love? I Long loved Saki? that book. Oh, loved good. it. She was one of my big influences. <laughs> that is really good. Yeah, I think you know maybe we need to find that we need the the Tibetan peepee long stockings. We need some young Tibetan peepee long stockings and Tibetophile long well, stockings. It's amazing. I Astrid, think that... Astrid Lindgren is the name of the lady, and she gave, it was an oh, amazing yeah. interview she gave. I, I don't have it electronically or as a PDF or I'd send it to you. You would really be inspired by it. I'll look for so it. So I can yeah. see you. I can see you doing that in this in this current. Uh, what would PP do during the Trump administration <laughs> during the during the final days of the colonial, uh, not yet post-colonial planet, which has to be post-colonial yeah. actually, and we have to do it in a decade. We don't have fifty years. We those don't. people, those politicians who say, yeah, well, we'll be cool by like the lie of Xi Jinping, who I used to kind of hope for, but I've now a bit given up for the moment. I never give up permanently anybody, but I have now a bit, bit given up the Politburo, really, in China. They're just mm -hmm. really forget yeah. about. It. But the point is, uh, um, uh, uh, I forgot what who's saying. <laughs> Wait, but I, you know what I can say? Mm -hmm. Longstocking. I can say that I think. What oh, I loved no, about well, yeah, long yeah, when, they, when yeah. they say, I know what I was saying. When they say sixty years, they're going to be carbon neutral. Forget about it. that's not possible. Forget about in, it. In no. Ten years, we need ten to fifteen, maximum twenty thirty five. If we're not settled in twenty thirty five, forget about it. It's just over. You know. Well, and California. I think that we all need to find out where our resiliency is, where our to push. Mm -hmm. To kind of put ourselves forward out of our comfort zones and mm -hmm. be resilient for this fight for our climate for our yes. future for our freedom yes. and um 
I think there's no more resilient example than Tibet. And so I honestly mm -hmm. think if you look at the longest standing nonviolent um, sort of cry of for independence, no, that course. we can look at that and say, no, like, course. that's where I draw my resiliency from. And I try to okay. channel it into other people who are becoming activated okay. because that's the kind of commitment we're all going to need. We're going to need that right. level of right. commitment. Wonderful. Level. I'm totally on. And, 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 and at the end of the, I think we should, we should stop this as a, uh, as a podcast because you can't get too long. Lose the audience. Yeah. But I'd like to I'd like you to be a key figure. I I'd, I'd like to do